What's up, everybody? This is Mason Plumley. We're back with another founder interview. Today, we have the privilege of Tade Oyurinde coming on. He is the CEO and founder of Campus Wire. Uh, Campus Wire is the complete teaching tool for professors to manage Q&A, implement active learning, and host live video lectures in office hours. Um, they help professors save time, engage their students, and offer single home base for their class. Tade, thanks for joining us. Sure thing. Thanks for having me, Mason. Appreciate you coming on. Um, so very exciting. Um, you know, we've had a couple EdTech Solutions come on the series, and um, you know, it, it seems like you guys are really helping out during a trying time for universities and professors and students. So, um, you know, I introduced the company, but let's hear from from yourself what problem you're solving and why Campus Wire is the solution. Sure. So the basic reason professors use Campus Wire is it's the uh, it's a communication tool that's designed specifically to education needs. So if you think through uh, the kind of communication that needs to happen in a college class, it's very different from the communication that needs to happen within companies. Um, so most of it's Q and A. So you know, I'm a student. It's two a.m. I'm working on a homework assignment. Where do I go to get help? If you don't use a tool like Campus Wire, then what will happen is all the students will just email the faculty, and you'll get like hundreds of emails the night before an exam or a big assignment to do. If you use a tool like Campus Wire, and there are others, then you structure all the communication and put everything in one place so that if student A has a problem, he asks a question, and then you can help the student and everybody else in the class can see it. So it's just a lot more efficient. Gotcha. Um, and then, you know, what? What challenges do professors have moving their um, all their content online, and and what are the existing solutions, and why is Campus Wire doing it better? Yeah, so what we're seeing specifically during coronavirus over the past um, couple months with the unfortunate situation is a lot of professors who've previously been like, no, I can kind of you know just get by with kids coming into office hours, or I don't need to be available to my kids, or I don't need to provide students with a place to communicate online actually have to revisit that and be like, okay, no, the student lounges are shut, campus is shut, I need to actually provide a place for students to collaborate with each other, and then I also need to have a more efficient way for students to ask questions and see announcements. The existing tools that were previously used would be the LMS forums, so if you think about Blackboard, which you probably use as a student, if you think about Canvas, which is the big new one, if you think about Moodle, they all contain uh, these discussion forums, but uh, if you recall, I mean, they're, they're never used. They're like, uh, right, right. one student said they're like screaming into a, a black hole. It was like posting on the discussion forums in the LMS, because they're really clunky and hard to use. So yeah. Campus Wire replaces the discussion form in college classes. Got it. Yeah, there was, I remember we did Blackboard at my, in my high school, and then I think we did Sakai for college, and all people Sakai. ever said was, well, we would say we never used it, we never engaged with it, but then the, the professor or the teacher loved to tell us that the assignment was on there and now it's late. So that's my <laughs> right. it's my uh, short short history with those. Um, so, you know, we, we've heard from a lot of students that they're either considering taking time off or uh, just leaving the university altogether given the, the pandemic. Um, yep. How are universities navigating? Um, what's the concern for them financially? and as well as retaining their current student base. Yeah, so it's it's a really, really tricky situation. So on one hand, <clears throat> if you don't open campus, uh, one Harvard professor I spoke to said, uh, Harvard, parent, Harvard student parents aren't gonna pay 80 grand for University of Phoenix. <laughs> right. um, and so, uh, you know, you do have this challenge of, you do need to open campus if you wanna retain students and certainly if you want to retain them at the cost that they've previously paid for tuition. But then you also don't want to run the risk of having an outbreak on campus. So that's the dilemma. And then that dilemma is happening within the context of there are already being uh, sort of all-time high frustration with how high tuition costs have, have been. And then, and then uh, you also have state funding cuts. So all the states are, I mean, so we've seen many of them are on the border of going bankrupt because of all the economic devastation from the shutdowns. And so it's almost a certainty that states are gonna cut funding that they give to the schools. Even the most elite schools in the country all receive state funding. Um, and so budgets are gonna be more expensive because schools have to invest in online learning that they didn't previously have. Meanwhile, 
uh, tuition revenues are probably going to come down with students not coming to campus, and then uh, and then there's also going to be budget cuts. So it's really tough. It's really tough. I do think there's there's solutions. Um, and we can sort of jump into some of those. I'm sure during the conversation, but uh, the challenge it is a very challenging landscape. Gotcha. As you look at Campus Wire as a as a business, obviously you're addressing a, a need and an issue, but um, you know, you had a great article featured on Medium about how to monetize education technology. Um, you guys have, have started with a freemium model. Um, what does the business look like for you as you transition to um, taking them off the freemium and, and converting dollars? Yeah, so <clears throat> for us, you know, we, we, built, uh, we built a tool that was designed specifically for students and we wanted to build something that was easy for students to use and that students would enjoy using. Um, now, the only reason it would make sense to do that is if you were going to actually have student and professor feedback input, impact your business. The reason Sakai and Blackboard and Canvas's uh, tools don't need to be usable is because the person who pays for those tools is an administrator, uh, not a professor, not, um, not, uh, <clears throat> not the students, not the people who actually use the software. And so the way to be successful with that business model is, uh, is, to, is to basically hire an army of really great salespeople. Um, you don't need to spend a you know, million dollars on that really expensive genius coder from Google. You know, just hire really great salespeople and you know, they're gonna remember the administrator, the IT administrator's you know, daughter saying, well, how's your daughter doing? And you know, over six to 18 months, you'll build that relationship and then you'll get like a four or eight or 12 year contract. And so that's why um, Sakai and Blackboard and, and Canvas don't great, build great software because the people who actually make the purchasing decision uh, don't actually use the software. Um, whereas what we wanted to do was actually say, okay, let's make professors the decision maker. And so professors can choose to adopt CampusWire even if their campus hasn't, even if their school hasn't actually uh, supported us or, or signed an agreement with us. Professors can adopt us and they make the decision as to whether or not their class will be on our basic plan, which is completely free for them and their students, or whether or not their class will access and utilize some of our advanced features, which would put them on, on our pro plan, um, in which case their department could pay or they can ask their students to pay, kind of like a textbook. And so if you want to build great software, then, then you have to actually architect the business around people who are going to use the software, not around uh, administrators. Gotcha. So get, share with our viewers a little bit of your background. I saw that you went to an aeronautical university. Are you a software engineer? Are you a developer? Um, what got you into the the founding of Campus Wire? Yeah, so I, I, I finished high school at 16. I'm a twin brother. I'm, I'm a twin. I have a twin brother. And uh, we both uh, finished high school early. And he went on to go uh, study at Howard University in D.C. for a bit and then went to Oxford uh, to do economics. I wanted to be a pilot. Um, I still fly a bit. Um, so I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And, uh, and then after a year... I decided to, to transfer to Leeds. There's several, um, several components to that decision, uh, one of which was that Embry-Riddle, it's 82% it's male. <laughs> and so if you think about you know, who wants to be a pilot, uh, who wants to uh, sort of go and you know, sort of be a fighter pilot or, or airline pilot, it's disproportionately men. And you know, I visited my brother, and he was just having a ball. So I was like, OK, I'm going to try <laughs> so, I um I, I decided to I, I went I went to an all boys high school so I get it. So you get all right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um yeah so that's that's how I decided to you know sort of try leads out. They're one of the uh, a few schools, only a handful of schools in the UK have uh, aerospace engineering, which is what I decided to major in. So um, I you know we did a bit of programming um, as a part of the coursework, but really uh, I've done web 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 development since I was in high school and. Um, and then, yeah, when I started my first company when I was a student, that's when I really got into working with one of my roommates to, to actually start really programming. Very cool. Um, so we had a, a professor chime in from West Point. Um, are you working mostly with uh, domestic universities? Are you working with higher learning abroad? Who are who's your customers? Yeah, so we're uh, we're used now in just over just almost three hundred schools. Um, most okay. of them are are in. Um, are in the U.S. Um, from UCLA, I think our UCLA is a top three school for us. More than 25% of students use this every week there. Um, to you know, uh, sort of 
small private schools, you know, everything in between. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, uh, and then we've also got schools in, in, in Europe and Universidad, Catholic Universidad de Chile is our biggest school in South America. So, I mean, and we did no marketing, no sales. Uh, people just Google, you know, education, better than Blackboard education tools. And I think we, we, we showed them ads if they Google that. <laughs> yeah, that's good SEO. Um, question from Aaron Ch Chadbury. What kind of support do you offer? One of the problems I find with existing solutions is that there's just not a lot of personal support and it's easy to give up. Right. So, well, the first piece is you don't want to write crap software. Um, if, if you if, if, if you have bad software, then the support load is going to be just unmanageable. It's going to be way too high. And, and then so it's basically impossible to offer good support because you cannot support millions and millions of people calling every day. So the first thing you want to do is write good software. Then the support load is going to be very manageable. Um, and so we offer 24-7 support. Uh, real-time chat for everybody, um, but it's it's not hard to get you know our folks on the phone either if you want to talk to someone directly. But real chat, not a bot, um, twenty four seven. Got you. Um, can you share with us the the makeup of your team? Because I think it's super interesting. A lot of these technology solutions, um, they they outsource or um, hire remote workers. Uh, how have you built out your team at Campus Wire, and how is it managing people that aren't all coming into the same office every day? Yeah, so uh, we're we're uh, we're twelve people, um, three abroad and nine in the U.S. Um, most of our engineering team is uh, <clears throat> is all based here in the U.S., but we do have a guy in Hong Kong and a guy in Pakistan, um, uh, and so we've actually been working remotely with them for a while. Um, I think it's so we have some practice with with work, remote working, which everyone's having to do now. But um, yeah, so we, we've got you know. Uh, Eight engineers and uh, and uh, and five non-engineers, so or four to five non-engineers, one contractor. So, I think you know, for us, we're a software company. Well, we have to build lots of complex software. We do live streaming, you know, lectures. It's not easy stuff. So, have to be gotcha. engineering heavy. Let's um let's pull up some screenshots from Campus Wire and, and just have you walk us through what we're looking at. Cool. Can we pull up the, uh, the other one? The I think the main one, the first one. Uh, let's see. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So right, what you go. got, what you've got there on the right is um, is sort of the campus wire class feed. That's where most of the magic happens. It's where faculty post announcements and students can post questions, and then they can answer each other's questions. Um, interestingly. Uh, if you look at the top, that question, this one, practice midterm question two part four, is asked anonymously. And that's one of our most important features. Campus Wire supports uh, three different levels of anonymity, and professors can choose which anonymity level they want in the class. If it's level zero, then you, it's basically off. You can't be anonymous. But if it's level one, then students can be anonymous to their classmates, but the faculty and TAs can still see who they are. Or they could uh, offer level two anonymity, which is full anonymity. Nobody knows who they are. And anonymity seems like a trivial thing, but it's actually super important because not everyone's like extroverted like me. There's a lot of shy kids, particularly in competitive schools, who don't want to be that person who asks the stupid question. And so, um, if you want to have the whole class participating and not it, and for it not to be like you know the black holes on the LMS where nobody engages, anonymity is really key. For sure, I remember uh, I heard some statistic like, you know, if you have a question you know, 75% of the class has the same question. So I just always yep. thought to ask my question and then I ended up asking that dumb question. So <laughs> I completely get what you're talking about. Um, question from the audience, uh, Monica asks, can you touch on your student design team and the ways in which they help you understand the needs of your end users? Yeah, student design team is key. I mean, I think the average age in our company is, is still 27. So we're, we're fairly young, but Gen Z, I think, I mean, when I talk to my Gen Z cousins, there's like a, a fundamental shift in the way they think versus us, which are millennials. And so um, if you really want to nail the experience for Gen Z, Gen Z, you know, they do most of their work often on their computers. I still use pen and paper when I'm doing particularly math, right? And so, for example, if, if you're dealing with Gen Z who does most of their math visually, well, then you need LaTeX support. LaTeX is the math type setting language. 
So it makes sending complex math equations as easy as sending emoji. That's a feature we had to build because kids are doing math on their machines. If, if we were thinking just with our own, oh, you're doing pen and paper, then maybe it's not as important. And so uh, it kind of keeps us close to the actual needs of the you know, students coming on the campus every year. Got it. Um, one thing we like to do is have founders share their um, either one of their uh, favorite experiences since being a founder and then also follow it up with some advice for, for the fellow entrepreneurs that are tuned in. So if, if you wouldn't mind sharing those thoughts with, with the audience, that'd be great. Favorite experiences. <laughs> I, I mean, there's nothing better than I think the feeling of, of sort of product launches. Um, actually, some of the features we've been building now have been pretty tough with our lecture live streaming tool. And so uh, one thing I, I do think about a lot is this concept of <clears throat> wartime and peacetime. And uh, so you think about wartime leaders, like the greats, you know, uh, FDR, Winston Churchill, you know, these great wartime leaders. And um, <clears throat> I communicated to the team back in, back in November. We, we'd spent uh, several months building uh, our live sessions, live streaming tool and our lecturing tools. Um, and then we found out uh, when we launched a, 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 our early testing that the load that it was causing on our servers was unmanageable because you have all these students jumping on a live stream all at the exact same time. Whereas typically, you know, our traffic was like, you know, fairly normal throughout the day. Um, this is like 2,000 kids all watching a lecture all at once. And so uh, we had to do a lot of infrastructure work to make that scale. Anyway, it turned out it was going to be about two months of work. And this is, we discovered this basically in November during Thanksgiving. And so I told the guys, I was like, hey guys, look, it's wartime. All right, I'm going to be coming in to the office and working from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. at least every single day. This is what's going to take for us to do this. We're going to have to do this through the holiday for us to be able to actually have any chance of actually shipping this tool in January when the new semester starts and we have to hit that January deadline. Um, I hope you guys will do it with me and you know we're just gonna do our best to get this out. And you know the whole team, everybody on the team committed and we actually got it out the door in time. And that was just like from war to like, we had to like literally convince ourselves this is war time, right? The That's Nazis great. are marching, yeah. we have to go. Um, and so- I love it. Yeah. So b before we jump into advice, I want to ask a really good question from the audience. Thanks for sharing that. Um, deadlines, I know, are very um, important to, to founders. So a uh, question from Deanna Capali. She said, I love this. I've been using video chat. And like you said, uh, my students are sending a ton of emails. Just saw the description of the broadcast today and curious what you mean by making office hours easier to manage. Sure, so <clears throat> we, we talked to a lot of professors and here are the, here's how they describe you know, the challenges around office hours. The first is um, there's not consistent attendance. So you know, week one, week two, week three of the class, there you know, may be no students popping in. Um, but then you know, midterms, there's like a line outside of the door. Everyone wants to come in um, similarly around finals. That's one challenge. The second challenge uh, was typically that uh, most times professors will do, in many cases, more instruction in office hours than they actually do in lectures. Um, there's you know, usually four hours or so of office hours a week and just two hours of lectures. And so if you're a student athlete like you were um, at Duke or if you're in ROTC or if you just have a complex class schedule, you may never be able to make office hours and so you're missing out on a lot of instruction. And right. so you can actually sort of solve a lot of problems with office hours by moving them online, or at least supplementing your in-person office hours with online office hours. And so the benefits of online office hours, much like this conversation we're having right now, uh, include that you can actually record them. And so students who aren't there and aren't able to make it can still get the benefits and participate and watch them on their own time. But then also, uh, we've heard from faculty, you know, you have to stick around on campus for like one kid to show up maybe uh, over the two hour office period, office hours period, versus if you did some of them online, um, you could you know, be at home with a glass of wine, chilling, and then when a kid rolls in, they roll in, and, and, and you just take that meeting then. So we, we basically have seen that a lot of our faculty have supplemented their in-person in office hours. So instead of doing maybe four hours a week, they'll do two a week, and then do two of them on campus wire. Got it, very cool. Um, do you mind uh, sharing some advice for, for your fellow founders out there? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much advice and I've been super lucky to have like lots of great advisors. Um, but I guess one thing that's that's relevant is 
a bit of advice my father keeps giving me. He, he calls me like every couple of days, sometimes at 4 a.m. It's like, son, coronavirus is like one of those events that can define a company like yours. Like, make sure you're doing everything possible to take advantage of the situation. And um, so, so um, I, I do think, you know, to, to other founders, it's useful to think through um, uh, sort of how, how is this going to change, you know, your, the landscape? This is a once in a generation event. Um, you know, are people going to be using your product more? Is there a new way that you can deliver your product to, to be more useful um, now that we're, we're remote? And then also, what ways, what, what changes in behavior are going to persist, right? Um, nobody's going to bars right now, so everybody's, you know, or, and nobody's going to restaurants, so we're all ordering Uber Eats. That'll eventually go back to normal. We're humans, we're social, we want to go to restaurants, we want to go to bars. But, um, Teaching online or telehealth or other in other industries, there will be permanent changes where people realize, hey, this can actually be done more efficiently in an online scenario. So um, I think figuring that out is really really valuable. If you could just give us some some perspective on what you think colleges and universities will look like in 2021, 2022, what, you, you're obviously very close to the situation. What's your outlook there? Yeah, I think. Um, so this year is this coming year is going to be it's going to be an interesting one. There's lots of different options that we can go into, but long term, I think every university is going to have to realize that, um, or is already realizing that being able to teach online is extremely important. So this notion of oh, there are just thirty percent of faculty who will never teach online. I think that's gone. Every faculty is going to have to be proficient in person and online um, with teaching, and so that means that schools are going to have to have proper infrastructure to teach online and schools are going to have uh, proper training to help faculty transition online and be able to go seamlessly between the two. Now, once you have faculty all proficient at online teaching, that opens up so many opportunities, uh, including hybrid learning. Hybrid learning is actually uh, students' preferred method of learning, where instead of having a Tuesday and Thursday class in person, uh, they prefer to have you know, Tuesday online and Thursday in person, or maybe the other way around. And then what that will allow schools to do is actually increase the number of students they can teach in classes, um, which will have lots of benefits for everybody in terms of being able to lower tuition. And so I think that um, st schools capacity to teach students with, with hybrid learning can actually increase and that'll benefit a lot of students. Hey, not sure what happened there, um, but we really appreciate um, you coming on. Appreciate your advice. Um, you know, obviously, what what you're doing for for uh, colleges, universities, for the students. Um, you know, it's it's really great. So we look forward to following your progress. Um, I know there are a lot of professors and a few university presidents who have reached out even um, on the live feed. So uh, awesome. hopefully, hopefully, you'll have some some engagement post post founder interview. Sure thing. No, I appreciate it. And, you know, we hope that, you know, we can be useful to schools as they're uh, figuring out what to do for the fall and then uh, and beyond. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tade. Cool. Cheers, Mason.